you think of white sugar, you probably think of this clean, white, powdery substance that when you add to anything, just makes it taste delicious. But you probably don't really think about where it comes from. If you do, you probably think of the sugarcane plant or maybe other sources of natural sugar like maple syrup or honey. But chances are, especially if you're in the United States, that's not where your white sugar actually comes from. In the United States, there's a 55% chance that your sugar came from this plant the beet, a root plant that has no real association with sweetness or desserts. On my channel, I've explored a lot of different sources of sugar, and I have to say, sugar beets has always stood out as the strangest. And there's kind of a reason for that. Of all of our sources of sucrose, it is the most recent and the most man-made. In previous videos, I've explored making my own white sugar from natural sources like sugar cane and sugar beets. And while I've gotten sweet results to work to make sweet recipes, by itself, it's never compared to store-bought white sugar. So in this video, I wanna do a deeper dive into why this crop exists and try to make my own granulated sugar as close as possible. Something that is actually pretty hard to do from this plant. So let's start out, I'm gonna plant some sugar beets and while they grow, let's dig into the history of sweetness and the rather dark history of sugar itself. Sweets have existed in human culture as long as we've had access to fruits and other naturally sweet plants. But the earliest source of concentrated sugar was likely from honeybees with evidence of human domestication as early as 3500 BCE in Egypt. Extraction of sugar from the sugarcane plant actually took a fair amount of time to figure out, with crystallized sugar not being discovered until 350 AD in northern India. It took the Crusades 700 years later for this plant to make it to Europe. With the discovery of the Americas, sugarcane was brought over by Christopher Columbus and formed one of the spokes of the trade triangle that brought massive slavery to the New World, allowing mass production of sugar at cheap prices for Europe and hooking a continent on the sweet tea. By the 1800s, the wars of Napoleon brought much of Europe under blockade and unable to trade for sugar. Enter the beet. In the 1750s, it was discovered that beets contained the same sucrose sugar as sugarcane just in small quantities, but it could be extracted. However, there was never really any need for it as the yields were so low. But with a demand for a local source of sugar, interest was found and selective breeds were undertaken, taking the regular beet from 8% to 18% in just 200 years. In our last video, I had Lauren explore trying to extract sugar another time using primitive techniques. This time we tried things a little bit different and we made sure to skin the outer surface of them and then soak them in water that was just below boiling and added a lime to try and prevent oxidization. The result was surprisingly better, but not that much greater. So rather than trying to do this historically to something that kind of predates when the sugar beet arrived, I wanted to try and reapproach this topic with some modern tools and see just how close to white sugar I could finally get. For the second year now, I've grown sugar beets in this little plot here. They're still a little bit smaller than what you would expect. So I think I got better, but still not up to commercial grade. Should be ready to harvest here. We just had a frost, so pretty much everything else in the garden is dead. But these guys are still going strong. So you can start harvesting and start the extraction process. Thank you to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post, who just sent us some new packages. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering awesome curated boxes of high quality goods from some pretty sweet brand. It's free to join and shows up right at your door. Let's open them up, see what I got. First up, we got the Alpine. Nice jacket here, help keep me warm this winter. So we start working outside in the cold still. One, we have the Bullseye Box. We have a set of throwing knives with a Bullseye Kit called the Target and a Sheaf. Here we got, so we have the fun little booze kit here that allows you to age your own liquors and your own little miniature barrel. You like tacos, you like knives, you like socks, you like coffee, Bespoke Post has you covered. Boxes are screened based on a preference quiz you fill out. The box lineup changes each month, so you can always discover something new and unique. Each of these boxes have around a $70 value, but only cost you a fraction of the price. You can cancel your subscription at any time. Get 20% off your first box with coupon code HTME20 or using link bespokepost.com slash HTME20. So I have the sugar beets here all cleaned up and washed up, ready to get started. So there's basically gonna be four big things that I need to watch out for that could potentially spoil my final results. First one is basically everything that isn't the sucrose. Other particulates that come with the sugar beets to give it the beady flavor without the pure sucrose that I'm after. And we're going through a few different methods of filtration to try and catch and remove any of those we can. Second one is gonna be oxidization. As the beets are cut, they start to oxidize and turn kind of a black and gray 
and it looks pretty gross. And uh, if you don't prevent it, it's going to kind of turn everything a, a really gross black color in the end. This is what we ran into last time. I tried to do this kind of primitively. So we can use a few different chemicals that are commonly used in brewing to kind of prevent oxidization. That also means I need to work pretty quickly to make sure I can process things before they react to the oxygen. Well, then the next one is caramelization, and that's gonna be an issue when uh, we start boiling it down to just a syrup. Get even just a little bit too hot, it'll caramelize and we we'll, won't have sugar, we'll have caramel and uh, that'll impact the flavor. And lastly, we have the molasses. Any sugar product, whether sugar cane or sugar beet, has molasses until it's separated at the end stage. With sugar cane, you're able to reuse that and make brown sugar and molasses and find other uses for it. With sugar beets, there's uh, some extra flavoring to it that doesn't make it too palatable. That extra flavor in there is just off. So I think separating the molasses is gonna be pretty important. Those are the four things you gotta watch out for. I'm gonna do this in a few small batches. Commercially, I don't think they actually peel them. I think they just run them through, but supposedly that might remove some of the beady flavor. So I'm gonna peel them, start processing them in a few batches so that I don't get too far ahead of myself and have them oxidize on me. So we have our first batch here, we'll weigh it out. At 934 grams, hopefully we can get at least 4% yield from that, which is going to be like four grams. <laughs> this is not gonna be much. So the next step is you cut them up into little slices like french fries called cassettes, and this is just to maximize the amount of surface area to extract the sucrose from. To speed this up, I'm gonna use a food processor and uh, reduce the amount of potential oxidization that might happen. So we'll start processing these, and then we can move on to the next step. So you can tell we're starting to get a little bit of brown here from oxidization, so let's get it into the solution and get stopped. <laughs> It tastes already, it's uh, very sweet. There's definitely sugar here, but also got that beet flavor. And the beet flavor is just like bitter and kind of carroty. So next up is the diffusion process. Probably the easiest way to do this is just run it through a juicer. The way it's done commercially is a little bit more effective. And in the process, it gets less of the beety flavor in the actual juice. So I'm gonna build a very ugly apparatus that will hopefully replicate the process that's done commercially. So this apparatus is kind of a rough, recreation of what is done industrially. Uh, this is my understanding. Apparently this is what yields a better result than just boiling it in a pot. Hot water, so it's just below boiling, between 50 and 80 degrees Celsius, is cycled on top of the sugar beet mash. Usually have it in a column, and it's moving up as water washes through it as it goes, successfully extracting more and more sugar as it goes. We've got a hot plate and a pot here that hold the water. Water will get heat up to between 50 and 80 degrees Celsius. The transfer pump here is gonna be pumping the water and cycling it through the steaming pot that we have here. In this, we'll be putting our our sugar beet solids that we ground up. This will cause it to cycle through, basically wash the solids over and over again. And supposedly this is the better result than just boiling it all in one mash. So uh, a little messy at the beginning and very foamy, but actually worked a lot better than I expected. It does seem to have turned kind of almost bluish. Might have oxidized some in the process, but next up we gotta strain our solid, collect all the juice that we can. Then we can do a, a few different filtration methods to remove all the impurities, and hopefully get rid of the beet taste. It's hot, still pretty hot. All right, so we got our uh, solution here. Got it all squeezed out and collected, and now I'm going to filter it. We got a, a few stray solids, so I'll run through a Brita filter. Brita's mostly just gonna remove the big chunks. I might remove some other stuff too. I don't think it'll remove the sugar. That's the only thing we're really after. So anything it does remove is gonna be an advantage. Just pour it in and uh, see how it turns out. It's unfortunately looking fairly brown and black. I think we got some oxidation happening here nevertheless. But I think we'll at least get the big stuff here. Let's compare and do a little taste test and see if it's actually removing any of the off flavor. There's before filtering. So there's actually a pretty decent visible difference. As long as you're not losing sugar, I think that's definitely an improvement. But uh, before I commit to it, let's give it a taste and see see if it actually tastes better. Here's raw, definitely sweet. Bit of the beet, not as much as before though. Oh, it's got a, a very bitter aftertaste though. I think that's gonna be the part that's really hard to get rid of. And then we have this. Not super flavorful. Actually, might be less sugar in this. I'm a little worried I'm losing sugar. It doesn't sound like it should, but there is a huge taste difference, and it seems less sweet, so I'm definitely paranoid. So I'm just gonna do a traditional screening to get out all the solids, and then we'll move on to carbonation. 
So we have the, uh, our sugar solution that's been heated up to 80 degrees and now we're gonna do the carbonation step. It's gonna add some milk of lime, which is dissolved calcium oxide into the solution. Then we're gonna introduce carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide, as it bubbles through, will react with the calcium oxide to form calcium carbonate, which is insoluble and will precipitate out. But as it forms in solution, it will grab everything else kind of around at the other impurities and pull them out as well. Start with an initial pass through the coarse filter. Get the big stuff out. It looks a bit clear already. Spent about a day drying out my syrup using a food dehydrator. And I find that works really well. I'm trying to boil it down and keep it below. Caramelization is just almost impossible. I feel like I've, I've burned too many things trying to do it that way. So what's really cool is you can actually see some forms of crystal starting to form in here. So that's a really good sign. We are just on the verge of crystallization. It's a nice, pretty thick syrup. I think it's oxidized maybe a touch because it is a little dark. It might just be the molasses that's still in it. That'll taste. That's super sweet, but even then, the beet taste is just very subtle. But we have the molasses in there, and that is going to be kind of the last, last little off taste I think we can try and get rid of. Commercially, that is done with a centrifuge. So next up, I'm gonna try and build a centrifuge. All right, so first off, I found this nice little perforated basket. It's more for like brewing teas, making chicken broth and whatnot. The only problem is the holes on it are, are a bit too big. Um, they're probably one or two times bigger than they should be. To remedy that, I'm gonna try and just line the inside with this bag and hopefully we can get a similar result. Yeah, that's going right through it. All right, so I ended up having to backtrack a little bit and go back to the dehydrator. Actually, in, on further research, I need to get this really thick. So this is a, a very thick, almost like a mud consistency. Very good sign right now is it's actually lightened up a lot. Just as it is, if it was completely dried and powderized, it'd probably be pretty white. But we still really want to get rid of that molasses as that's what's throwing off the flavor. Hopefully it's now thick enough to run through the centrifuge. Every kind of step of this, I lose just a little bit on the surfaces it's stuck to. So. Kind of reluctant every time something doesn't work out. But hopefully this will be thick enough to just get the molasses out. So we got this set up. Maybe it's gonna work. I tried to make a centrifuge some years ago. It didn't go super great. Yeah, shouldn't have gone faster. <laughs> this is more likely to work. I think it's a little bit better design, but uh, it's still basically a drill press wildly spinning a bucket at the end of a wire. So lots of things could go wrong right now. Hopefully I don't die. Perfect. It would have worked if it just didn't not work. So we have a rod that goes through and there's a hole at the end of the bucket. So it all should be held there. I think I'm gonna clamp down the bucket so it doesn't go flying. Okay, let's see what happens. Side edges. You can see the little specks along the bottom there. Definitely was spitting out some stuff we got collected on the outside edge. All right, so I think maybe two small holes. So I'm gonna try putting it in the big holes and see, see if we get a decent result that way. Some big chunks. All right, here we go for round two. Let's see if we lose everything. Side here. So I think that's a lot better for molasses. After a very surprisingly long process of drying, I now have the completed white sugar. And with it, I have a few different comparisons. So here we have store bought, professionally processed white sugar made from beets. This is 100% beet sugar. This is the gold standard. If you can't tell, 
on the white plate, it's it's white on white. So this is the stuff after all my multiple steps of processing. It's kind of white. The color is a little disappointing. It's definitely got that brown hue to it. Hard to say what exactly caused that. Of the multiple factors that I talked about, it could really be any of them. All right, we still got a lot still on here, but our total yield. All right, so we lost a lot along the way, tasting it as I go, but we're down to about 2% yield from our beginning mass. Not the greatest yield here. A little bit of a taste test, I guess, to really see what might have gone wrong. This stuff, I did like the very minimal process. When you look up how to process sugar beets, this is the process they talk about. You cut it up, you throw it in a juicer, and you dry it. So this is kind of the comparison without all the fancy contraptions that I tried to do and fancy steps I did to try and remove impurities and spin out the molasses. This is minimal effort. This is the primitive method. This is what Lauren made. Try to be very careful about the temperature you were heating it at. Try to prevent oxidization with a lime and slowly drying it out. We have a, a bit of a gradation. Starts from very white, close to white, light brown. Oh, it's, a, it's a pretty much orange. Let's start from least offensive to potentially most offensive. So we start with the store-bought stuff. Yeah, that, that tastes like sugar. What do you know? It's just sweet and that's it. 100% sucrose. And here is my attempt at making 100% sucrose. Okay, that is surprisingly good. I, that is a lot closer than I expected. I would call that sugar. It has just this slight hint of something that was a little bit off. Like, I don't even know if I would guess beet. It's just like, there's something there that's not quite right. Hard to say like what went wrong to turn the color off and like what could be improved to improve more. I'm gonna guess the centrifuge, just because it's kind of an exact science to like get the right size hole and the right size speed and the right amount of moisture that uh, to get just the molasses out. So if I had to guess, there's probably still a little bit of molasses in there throwing that off. I think you could cook with this and you won't even notice. Meanwhile, let's try these other two. Minimally prepared, this is basically the sugar beets we've used before and I don't think it's gonna taste good. No. <laughs> no, that is, that is beet first, sugar second. It's actually impressively beet flavored, considering that I feel like the sugar beet isn't even that all that beety by itself. But concentrated here, this is like taking a bite of a regular beet. Anything you put this into is just gonna be beet flavored. Uh, the sugar, I think it's gonna be kind of accidental. Then lastly, we have the primitive method. So here we tried to do a, a few techniques from this as best as you could primitively. Pretty skeptical, but let's give it a taste. All right, I gotta say, it's actually probably between these two. Even primitively, we got a better result, but it's still all oh, that aftertaste. It's definitely in that aftertaste. I can taste the beat afterwards. I have to say, I'm pleasantly surprised by my results. This, I would call white sugar, maybe off-white sugar. It's a, it could definitely use some improvements and it might not pass commercial grade, but uh, I think cooking wise, you're not gonna notice the difference. This is actually pretty good. And I think probably the best sugar I've ever made. Just saying a lot, I've done a lot of different sugars. And I hope everybody's kind of enjoyed this little deeper dive into white sugar and trying to perfect this science. Uh, it's a little bit different from a normal content of doing things more primitively, but I like to mix things up a little bit and hope, I hope people enjoyed it. When it comes to man-made sugars though, this is the most recent form of sucrose, but perhaps the most famous form of man-made sugar is high fructose corn syrup. And that is a little bit of the white whale that I want to conquer someday. I took a little bit of a stab at trying to make my own corn syrup in, I think it was my candy corn episode, but trying to make actual high fructose corn syrup is something I would absolutely love to tackle. Thanks to everybody for watching. Thanks to all of our supporters on Patreon. Without you, this won't be possible. If you want to keep us making great videos like this, consider supporting. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.